there was that way in which their one economic and bureaucratic and political system was dying. Another one was coming into being. And that's why I got so interested in Comenius, because he was in, kind of technically speaking, a time between worlds very similar to ours, because some of the work that I ended up doing in, in civilizational class dynamics convinced me that we were in a situation where our existing economic and political structures were uh, past their, they were dying. Uh, and we were not in the context of new of new ones. Uh, and Comenius was aware of that. And he basically thought that the only way through that kind of situation was educational innovation at a very high level. Welcome to the Nordic Meta Modern. Today I uh, have invited Zach Stein to talk about a gentleman who has really um, had an influence on everybody's life. His name is, is Comenius. So welcome, Zach. Hey, thank you. It's, it's great to be here and to talk about Comenius with you. I know you can hardly wait, but before you get to talk about Comenius, uh, we would like to know, or at least I would like to know a little bit more um, about yourself and how you found Comenius. Mm. Let's see. I'm what they call a high achieving dyslexic. Uh, which means I've always been in a weird relationship to school systems and eventually became a philosopher of education, um, but didn't hear about Comenius that entire time, which is to say for the first 38 years of my life when I was intensively thinking about education, going to a graduate school of education, studying the major figures in philosophy of education, never heard of Comenius, um, studied cognitive development, <clears throat> studied sociology, philosophy, ended up also getting into the field of studying existential risk and civilizational collapse, um, a few other big picture issues. Uh, and it was in the context of actually researching Rudolf Steiner and the history of Western esotericism when I discovered a book by Francis Yates called The Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Uh, and in that book, there's an entire chapter on Comenius. This is where I discovered Comenius. Um, so a very roundabout way. <clears throat> In fact, having nothing to do with research on education, I stumbled on Comenius researching the history of Western occultism and esotericism, uh, which just gives you a sense of the scope and complexity of Comenius as a man and as a scholar in terms of the different places in our culture that he affected almost invisibly. Uh, and more specifically, he was involved in this thing that became called the Invisible College, um, which was an actual existing network of scientists, and academic, natural philosophers in that time, which is the 16th, uh, 17th century. And now uh, we're already going into uh, now we're getting, Comenius. Now we're getting into, now we're getting into it. So, <laughs> so that's, how I found, that's, how I, that's how I found Comenius. And then I went on like a two-year really deep inquiry into Comenius and discovered that, at least in the English language, it's hard to find everything one wants to find to really research Comenius. Uh, so in a sense, I'm a very amateur Comeniologist, right? And there's a whole field of Comeni, Comeniology, basically, which is also gives you a sense of the scope of, of the actual corpus that one has to deal with when they're, when they're trying to research Comenius. Uh, and so that was, a, that was a very, very interesting year full of synchronicities and other things that led me to really kind of connect with the spirit of Comenius. Uh, and then published this article through Perspectiva Press on, on Comenius, where I kind of gave a, an initial account. Um, but I'm planning a longer kind of book-length treatment um, of Comenius at some point. So that's a little bit about me, how I found Comenius. Yeah. So, I mean, I... I have I had never heard about him either until I started writing and researching the Nordic secret mm -hmm. um, and learning from you and learning from what I, I read when I was researching that I, I realized that um, I mean he really changed the the landscape of Europe uh, and the world and there is not a person who lives today who has gone to school whose life has not been you know affected by him um, and so in a, in a moment you are going to get to say what what it is that he did um but i i went to the Comenius museum in prague because mm. he's, he's from prague and uh, i was there with my then boyfriend and we were two people and we were there all alone for i think an hour and a half 
and it was a beautiful museum and they had all this teaching material and you know a, a school room where you could go in with a school class i bet you know uh the czech uh children are forced to go there at least once during their school hours and learn about <laughs> the the big master Comenius and and don't get it so mm -hmm. here we are uh united around Comenius. And one thing from a Nordic perspective um, is that he was actually used as a school consultant in Sweden, but not so much in Denmark. But I guess you will you will get into what he actually did. And now I'm gonna now I'm gonna let you talk about Comenius and uh, <laughs> what it was that he what he came up with and why he's so uh, you know uh, important. Right, <clears throat> and and there are parts of the world where he is still remembered. You know. Uh, Eastern Europe. Obviously and, not our part of the world, but and, but yeah, not not the Anglophone part of the world. Um, <clears throat> but I had a colleague, Sam Oberger, who's from Slovenia, and uh, he, of course, had learned about it in childhood, and it was kind of he was he was like, "Why are you interested in Comenius?" Because it was one of those figures you learn about in 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 grade school. That's just some, you know. Uh, Tried to avoid him forever after. Yeah, right. Uh, but yeah, so he, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to summarize the work. So most of the things we take for granted when we think of modern schools, uh, so age segregated classrooms, um, uh, curriculum that are targeted to people's ages and stages of development, um, <clears throat> curriculum that tries to integrate the sciences you know, with the humanities, like with um, ethics and religion, for example. Um, uh, the attention to the needs of the learning disabled, um, the attention to the needs of mothers and infants, um, the conception of education as the vehicle by which a society could be fundamentally reformed if it was made public and good enough and accessible enough. Um, that education could unite the plurality of faiths and bring peace at a global level. So these are all Comenius's ideas, which he expressed in the at the peak of his work in the 1630s and 40s. So you have to think about in the 17th century, here's a man who is uh, witnessing the fall of the feudal empires in the Thirty Years' War um, and prophesizing about a time when we will have large, comprehensive public educational systems that would try to, and this was his catchphrase, to try to teach all things to all people in all ways. Um, and now this is a sentiment that in, if you heard this in the 1630s and 40s, your brains would come out of your ears because like, what are you talking about? We're actually having the Catholics and the Protestants torturing and killing one another. Um, we're witnessing the basically economic collapse of an entire kind of economic and political system of feudalism and the, and the birth of what would, be, would come to be the capitalist world system. And Comenius is in this mix, and I can talk more about the historical context. But the radicalness of the ideas is hard to actually emphasize because we take them for granted. Um, he also didn't like beating kids, right? Like just well, corporal. Just about to ask, yeah. could you maybe describe the school system before Comenius? Because I mean, all the stuff that we take for granted, we take for granted. Right. But what was it like before Comenius? Yeah, I mean, you had uh, you had a feudal system, so the the vast majority of kids didn't go to anything that we would call a school. They were involved in perhaps the guild system and learned a trade or learned at their house. There were religious schools where a small number of kids would go uh, and they would be basically tortured. Uh, they would have to learn obscure Latin texts, which uh, demanded a certain focus on grammar, rhetoric, and logic about topics they had no interest in. If mistakes were made, you were beaten, literally beaten. Uh, Sometimes kids were ostensibly tortured. Comenius, people think Comenius didn't do well in those schools, and this is one of the reasons why he uh, worked against them. But the religious schools, again, were parochial in the sense that they taught nothing about the emerging sciences and humanities that were coming out of the Renaissance. And again, this is between the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, so we're in this time between worlds. So the schools are quickly becoming outdated in the sense that most of the kind of the rural populations that were moving into the major cities that were beginning to grow as a result of new forms of commodity exchange and what we would call the early days of capitalism, uh, these schools were not preparing them 
for any kind of complex urban life. They were preparing them to deal with Latin texts and obscure theological issues, mostly being trained to work in the church. So scholasticism and angels dancing on the tip of yes. a pin and stuff yes. like that? Yeah. Combined with corporal... How, how to burn witches and... Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's the thing, that women weren't being educated. Um, the learning disabled weren't being educated. The poor were not being educated. The non-Christians were not being educated. These were all people communities thought needed to be educated <laughs> uh, if, if humanity was to be step into its full um, potential. Um, and how about he, women, girls? Uh, say again? How about women and girls? Yeah, they were not being educated. I mean, you had nunneries. You had nunneries and you had ways that women were learning, you know, trade crafts and other things. But it was a... Uh, by our standards, remarkably backwards and superstitious and ineffective uh, educational system, which specifically didn't intend to cater to anyone uh, and didn't see the relationship between education and politics and religion and economics, which Comenius was starting to see. He was starting to actually see that because a new world is emerging, we need a fundamentally new form of education. Um, so, so he was, uh, his work went through three basic periods. Um, you have his early work um, where he is essentially innovating in the use of print technology to create what we would call language learning textbooks. Uh, he wrote a book called The Doorways of Language, basically, which became the standard language learning textbook for the entirety of Europe and parts of the Islamic world and Russia. Uh, and was the most, uh, it was the most, it's like up there with the Bible and stuff in terms of a book that has been reprinted in an incredible numbers of times. Um, the Orbis Pictus is another one, which is sometimes called the first kid's book or the first picture book, but it was also a language learning book. This book was massively influential and printed and used by the generation that included Goethe and Herder. Uh, and those those folks. Um, so his early work was sometimes called encyclopedic, where he is trying to make dictionaries and language learning tools and comprehensive textbooks and and other things. Um, then he transitioned to a period which was called the Pan-Sophic period, and this is where he went from focusing on the kind of concrete tactics of reforming education through innovation in text to trying to literally articulate a comprehensive philosophical system that would integrate science and religion and politics in a way useful to a basically a planetary educational system. Uh, and then the third phase <laughs> is where he went beyond the pan-sophic into the pan-orthic, which means the single direction for global reform. So he basically began to use his comprehensive theory of everything to speculate about what it would take to make a viable planetary civilization. And he believed that the core of such a civilization would have to be what he called the Pan-Sophic College of Light, which was a comprehensive educational organization, um, which was a knowledge clearinghouse, integrating science and religion and feeding all of the schools in all of the areas with information and knowledge and other things. Um, so it's not doing- I'm just I mean, there, yeah. there are two things about that. I would like to go back to the to the book because we're going to share the link to the Perspectiva article. And in mm -hmm. that, you have some pictures of some of the pages in it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what struck me was the simplicity and the pedagogical, you know, um, yeah, I, simplicity, but genius mm -hmm. of, of having the same text in, there's a picture and then you have the same text I think you showed it in Latin and English, but it was, you know, because it was the, the non-Latin text was translated into so many other languages. That was, that was the whole point. And then he has by each of the words, there's a number, and then you can find the, the same word in the other language through the number on the other side of the page. And we have to really grasp that before that, you had had all these, you know, blah, 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 cum, blah, blah, something, something in Latin. And the kids had just, you know, had, you know, a whacking if they got it wrong. And it would have been like, we have the word hocus pocus, which comes from the hocus corpus in the church, which was like the magic that the priest was performing. 
right. um, which turned the the uh, the bread into the, the <clears throat> corpus of of Christ. Um, so a lot of children were just you know slaving along in little dark school rooms with teachers who kept beating them if they got the Latin wrong. And this it, it really is mind blowing from our perspective that that mm -hmm. nobody saw before that this didn't work. Yeah. Um, and that you had teachers who kept reproducing what they must have, have gone through in their school mm -hmm. and thinking that it would work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is, and there's there's many things to say. It's what your point about Comenius's genius in the innovation, literally, of just the use of print technology to have a page layout where there's a picture that's annotated with numbers, and it's a picture of like, a place where they're dying clothes or a mill or a farm or something, right? It's an everyday slice of like life. Everyday things, so whatever every child day. would know. Or that any child would know. Each item in the picture has a number. Then below that, you've got two columns. One column is a numbered column of Latin descriptions of the picture. And then mirroring that, you have a numbered column of descriptions of the picture in your native language. Right. So you can you can triangulate from your native language to the picture to the Latin in a way where you can sit down with the book and teach yourself Latin in a way that's relevant to your life and improve your knowledge of your own native language. Um, and so this was like, I mean, this is the equivalent of just like a, a miracle of technology. And this was the thing that made him famous. Like these were used everywhere. And whenever he went anywhere in Europe, moving from kind of royal court to, to royal court, he was Comenius. He was the dude that created this book that allowed everyone to learn Latin and their native dude language. Dude with a book. Yeah, he became famous as a result of this book. And it was reprinted until the 1900s. Like it was, it was and used because uh, it was so good. Um, it was not until radio and television and other things came. Uh, so, in the, so he invented the picture book. He invented the textbook. Um, and as a result, got people to think outside of the box in terms of what was possible for language learning and, and what was so important about language as a as a doorway into intelligence and the growth of the human mind. And this was a like, Comenius had a, a whole other side, which was a very complex anthropology, which is to say a very complex conception of what the human is the nature of the ontology of the human and the universe completely informed his pedagogical theorizing. Um, and so it's important to get, um, to get that as well, that he, he, was, he was making decisions pedagogically based on a very complex set of theories of human development. That's what we would call them now. So he, he wasn't, uh, <clears throat> in a sense, thinking what, how he learned or how people ought to learn. He was actually looking at what kids and animals and nature were actually like and thinking about how a one should lead people along the path towards greater um, towards greater knowledge and understanding and, and beauty. Um, and it's worth <laughs> and his conception of the human is worth considering. I mean, it's a very complex neoplatonic um, uh, kind of anthropology, spiritual anthropology, um, which is very, very interesting and includes a kind of neo, uh, kind of a, an early perennial philosophy view of the relationship between the religions um, and, a, and a very strong uh, sense of what we would now call uh, biomimicry, which is to say he was looking at the way the natural world, and for him it was from Paracelsius and the doctrine of signs and, and other things, but looking at the way the natural world can teach us about ourselves and our own relations and how pedagogy could be quote natural in that sense of following from the patterns of nature. Um, so, and again, that folds into his pan um, And uh, so he becomes very well known as a result of these textbooks. And then as his pan thinking moves forward, he becomes known as a comprehensive kind of philosopher of everything. This becomes very attractive to uh, what we would now call kind of like Freemasons and esotericists who invite him to the United Kingdom, where he is involved in, some people believe, beginnings of modern Freemasonry, the instantiation of the Rosicrucian movement, and the founding of, of this invisible college, which I mentioned. This includes Samuel Hartlib and other people who would eventually be involved in the founding of the Royal Academy of Sciences, 
in the 1660s, which is the first organization officially considered to be like the Enlightenment, capital E, like Western Enlightenment, is the Royal Academy of Sciences, which is actually an instantiation of the Comenian Invisible College, which is Comenius's attempt to bring into the world what the Rosicrucians wanted to do, uh, which was to uh, found a planetary order based on a Christ-like consciousness. So it's a very weird <laughs> uh, story that Comenius is involved in. Um, and there's a whole bunch of his theological work and again, his conceptions of the human uh, which lay the seed, which lay the groundwork for a very complex um, kind of contemporary mysticism. And again, he was very well known. Uh, so, like Goethe, Herda, Hegel, Fichte, like all of these folks would have known Comenius. Descartes had a huge unpublished manuscript on Comenius. The rumor is that it was Comenius that got Descartes to publish his meditations. Like, this cannot be confirmed, but I've seen it in several places. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's just to say, like, he was a huge figure in his yep. day. Um, and he's talking to the Swedish crown and, and the, in, in the United K, in the United Kingdom, he's doing, uh, in England, he's doing the same thing. I mean, he's, he's, uh, hired as a consultant and, and we <laughs> so have, uh, political leaders who are seeing that things are falling apart and they are in the war, the 30 year war and the hundred year war. Um, mm -hmm. and so I, I, I think we have a tendency to look back at people in history and and see the sort of the general picture and then assume that they were a little bit stupider than we are uh but when you dig into a guy like this or into the details both in, in theology philosophy education politics yeah. all this stuff i mean they're actually um we're the same people i mean they're they have the smart people and they have the dumb people and they have the uneducated people and they have the educated people and you just yeah. you know nothing new under the sun which you know take us all the way back to the old testament and one of the things that uh once you read the old testament the new testament and the quran you realize that all three texts struggle with interest on loans and it's really a document about how does the economy function so uh, and and they're struggling with uh, education and how how does everybody get the message? Mm -hmm. um, the Judaism tells uh, parents or the father that he should you know talk about this all you know when you're walking and we're when you're in your home and when you're uh, out in the street and the uh, there's a missionary commandment in um, in Christianity and you have a, also a commandment in the Quran for for teachings so and when we have this really really long and deep tradition and i'm just talking about europe and the judeo-christian islamic tradition further east uh, of course also um so so just to give you know communions a little bit of uh context in that regard as well uh, especially for those of us who are not historians because uh, we may have this sort of thin uh understanding of of what what went before us one of the words that i stumbled upon or realized i had heard it before when i wrote about the nordic secret and building was the greek word paideia and and you have written about that as as well and the word encyclopedia encyclopedia actually yeah. comes from circles of paideia circles of of building circles of learning and growing and um yeah uh realizing more about the world and making it your own and going out there with it so we do have some extremely deep roots wow. down into these thoughts and and communion is is one really strong link in that chain yeah he is and he's and he's very much writing not from a secular context but he's not he's also not writing from a, a medieval pre-modern context nor is he modern he's, he's literally in between so when you read his theological work it's fascinating because He's trying to factor Bacon, and he's trying to factor the natural sciences that are emerging, but he's also looking at the Bible in ways, searching for biomimicry uh, and searching for universal educational principles in biblical text. Uh, and so much of what Comenius is doing was a result of the fact that he was also a, a bishop, uh, the leader of a small religious sect called the Bohemian Brethren, or the Unity. Uh, they were a very radical, mystical sect that were persecuted by both the Protestants and the Catholics 
during the Thirty Years War. <laughs> uh, and this was because they were trying to reconcile between the Protestants mm. and the Catholic. They were technically a Protestant sect, but they saw no reason for Christians to be fighting. Uh, and they were integrating Hebrew mysticism into their practices. Uh, so you can draw this line uh, you know, from the Renaissance kind of study of the Kabbalah uh, into these esoteric societies that emerge uh, with the end of the feudal system and the transition to modernity and, and communities is right there um, in a sense. Uh, you know, even the notion of the Pansophic College of Light, or sometimes called the School of Schools, uh, comes, I believe, and I could, I'm trying to find this, you know, uh, from the Zohar, which is a core text of Hebrew mysticism, which speaks of the heavenly academy. And the heavenly academy is very, very similar to the communion idea of the, of the Pansophic College of Light. Um, so, so there's a lot <laughs> of like windows into Comenius's activity. And it's worth mentioning, like, you know, he, his place, which we now call like the Czech Republic, um, uh, during that time was just decimated by the 30 years war. So he himself personally was a refugee. He fled, he literally hid with his manuscripts like in caves and stuff. And then like was sheltered by, you know, aristocrats. And then the entire thing was burned and he had to like leave. And stuff. Like it's, it's really crazy, harrowing <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, story. <laughs> he had his own printing house or printing company. I mean, and, and we're talking, you know, a big chunky uh you know gutenberg uh yeah. you know solid wood with uh yeah. movable type and lead and yeah. and paper whatever the use of paper back then and it was like advanced it, technology at the time it was and like the thing i mean that's like you know having your own server park or something it's true um, and he is and he that's how he ended up, he ended up in amsterdam uh, ultimately, for that reason, because he was beginning to have these relationships with these large printing interests who were from the future, which is to say, like the Dutch East, the just the Dutch East India Company was as different from feudal systems of economic and bureaucratic organization as the school systems Comenius was proposing were from the feudal school systems, right? So he was aligning with this emerging world and seeing the printing press as the way through. And it's worth mentioning on the printing press issue <clears throat> that he was in the midst of what we would, if one of the first, what we would call modern propaganda campaigns. And so mm. printing press enabled large scale population centric propaganda <laughs> existed in the 30 years war on a very, very, in a very serious way, which was to say these crazy pamphlets and posters that were villainizing and demonizing the different sides, the Catholics versus the Protestants. Um, uh, this is where you start to get basically an arms race of propaganda around the conception of hell. This is why Christian hell is so scary because during the 30 years war- my hell, is, my hell is worse than your hell, so- My hell is worse than your hell. <laughs> Therefore convert or else you'll end up in a worse hell, right? So it becomes this thing. And so Comenius is seeing all of this and he's seeing this as anti-education. And this is where he starts to say things about uh, that in the absence of education, you get what we call anti-education. So whereas education, you'd be humanizing, that actually we don't become human unless we're educated. We're not just born human. We actually have to be educated into humanity, which means- so That's the build up part and the paideia part. Exactly, which means that if we only have propaganda, we become something worse than an animal, uh, which is that, so it's like the opposite of the human isn't the animal, it's the, the demonic. Uh, and this is communities views that we saw that because the printing press was powerful, we were actually whipping people up into a demonic frenzy using the same technology we could use to pacify them through education and wisdom. Right. Just so like he, Twitter. Just like Twitter. So he literally was trying to, this is why he went to get printing presses, like as part of an information warfare. He's like, we're gonna have to do education instead of propaganda and in a sense he succeeded with his language learning texts like um because he was trying to get everyone in europe to speak one language he thought it should be latin right like that seems a, a good Which way to get things. made total sense back then Which made total sense back then it was a big push one language and then we could have peace and <laughs> so it's really really visionary so i, I would like to um to add two things one is one is that the dutch east india company because i think that is one thing that a lot of people were 
people like me uh, are not usually aware of that capitalism started somewhere. And it, it started where, where people, I mean, it didn't just come out of, of nowhere. It was actually part of this process. And it was very, you know, uh, there was this new world where, where Europeans could go and steal stuff and take slaves and do really bad things. And how did, how, how did they end up affording that? Well, uh, they chip in in little, you know, pieces of, or, or piles right. of money. And that became a big pile of money. And so you owned the ship together. And, and then you sent off the ship in a, in an, Exactly, you bought stock. Exactly. So basically, two things are one is that yeah, you get the joint stock trading company and the insurance industries, which grow around these massive, what we would call now colonial early capitalist enterprises. But you also have printing press enabled uh, bureaucracy and bookkeeping, uh, which just up levels the efficiency of these things vis a vis the feudal system in a way the feudal system literally can't register. And I make the comparison, it's like us looking at Google. What we, what's actually Alphabet now, where it's like, is that a company? Kind of, that's a company, but uh, it's actually- Facebook called Meta or what is- Right, and what does it actually do? And like, how big is it actually? And so there was that way in which their one economic and bureaucratic and political system was dying. Another one was coming into being. And that's why I got so interested in Caminius because he was in, kind of technically speaking, a time between worlds very similar to ours because of some of the work that I ended up doing in- civilizational class dynamics convinced me that we were in a situation where our existing economic and political structures were uh, past their, they were dying, uh, and we were not in the context of new, of new ones. Uh, and Comenius was aware of that. And he basically thought that the only way through that kind of situation was educational innovation at a very high level. Um, because, uh, you know, the, he called them the human things. He talked about the reform of the human things. Because again, he's, 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 it's hard to understand it without realizing he's, his whole life is religious. Like the whole, there's not, he's not secular, right? <laughs> but he's not a crude uh, medieval. Yeah, there, so there is, in his worldview, there is a God that, that influences us. Is there, are there mm -hmm. spirits that walk in and out of our heads and control us? Are there demons? Yeah, so, uh, and this is where it gets, so w one question to ask is, okay, so if he is this, why don't we know about it? Uh, and there's actually a pretty good answer to that, um, which is, so he's involved in these publishing interests. He's involved in this mystical Protestant sect. One of his close friends from childhood, literally from like what we would call grade school, like the early young childhood, um, becomes a visionary seer kind of, um, uh, you know, person who predicts the future through visions and dreams, right? Uh, and he sees, you know, the decline of the Habsburg Empire and the collapse of the of the Catholics and the rise of the Rosicrucians and this whole thing. And so Comenius, because it's his friend, basically publishes this guy's religious visions, right? Um, and they're very, I mean, they're very crazy. Like they're not, you know. And so he basically puts, Comenius puts all his marbles in this like mystical, visionary, prophetic thing. Uh, and then as soon as Comenius dies, this guy, his buddy, says that he made it all up and converts to Catholicism, right? So in Comenius, in the immediate memory of Comenius's death, his reputation is dragged through the mud. And the Royal Academy of Sciences, which is founded based on his vision of the Invisible College, wants to understand itself as scientific, precisely not the weird Comenian Rosicrucian mysticism, right? So it really is very much a situation where during his, the height of his prime, it was cool to actually believe in religion and science at the same time. Uh, and then within 20 or 30 years of his death, uh, because of the violence of the religious wars, it became much, much, much more popular just to kind of denigrate religion or have some deism and mostly be committed to a form of science and so therefore many people wanted to have all of communism's best ideas and none of his weird religious <laughs> mysticism uh and so it's very much the case that it wasn't so much actively suppression as it was that many of the people like Hartlib and others who were taking his ideas into the center of of political power and making these public school systems they just stopped mentioning <laughs> the association with communists because of don't go there don't go there because because he was so overtly religious and because he endorsed these 
these mystical views um, of his. And what year did he die? So he died in 1670. He was born in 1592. Yes, I mean, the, the, the word Bildung um, comes from the German word Bild, and mm -hmm. it was a pietistic movement of shaping yourself mm -hmm. in the built in the image of Christ. And that is in the 1600s. And it's part of this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's where the Europeans, where the devout Christians discover their uh, their feelings and the the spiritual path the, the spiritual part of Christianity becomes extremely emotional. It's also where Bach composes his, you know, amazing music. So there is a European discovery of our emotions. And so that's the first use of the word Bildung and Bild in, in that sense. And then because of, of the Enlightenment and because of science, uh, Christianity, at least in the, in the reading and thinking and talking classes, uh, yeah. becomes, you know, what, what our grandparents did and we're not going to do this. Yeah. And then when we get to the 1700s, um, so from around 1770 and onwards, Bildung becomes a secular concept and the build, the image, is the image of all that is inside you that can unfold and, and how you become you. Yeah. Um, another uh, interesting thing about Comenius and you say the Rosicrucians and perhaps the, um, the, the Freemasons was that many of the Bildung thinkers that I uh, you know, studied and explored, whenever I read their uh, the bio, uh, at least half of them were like, and he was a, a Freemason. I was like, that, that's, you know, too many of them to be a coincidence, unless mm -hmm. everybody who read books were, you know, Freemasons. And so the, the Bildung philosophy, or, or a really crucial part of it is, of course, education and knowing about the world and knowing, you know, your culture and being, you know, cultivated and, and growing uh, among other people and, and being socialized, but it's also the emotional development. And Friedrich Schiller has this sort of three people of the person who is in the throes of his emotions, the emotional physical person, the person who uh, plays by the norms of society, what he calls the rational person and who lives by other people's expectations. And then there's the free person, which he also calls the, the, uh, the playing person. And so the free person is the person who can both feel his own emotions and who has internalized the norms of society and is therefore has this double thing inside him and or her. Uh, he uses the German word mensch, which is neither masculine nor feminine. Um, and so the free person always has this dilemma. And what I realized was that uh, the Freemasons, uh, they have the apprentice and then they have I forgot what the middle concept is, but then they have the, the master, the free person. And so there is this sort of three-step understanding of our emotional development. And I was wondering if, if Comenius has that as well, if we can dig even further back to find that development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and I've seen it in a couple places of Comeniologists who they want to make the argument that it was really kind of, if you look closely at what Comenius was saying about how education and art will work, he was saying Bildung. Like he was saying basically like each of us has, you know, the image of God implicit within them. <clears throat> it will not just simply come out if we just do whatever, like we have to do serious education uh, in the way of Christ. And then we lead people back to this image of self. And then that will make for ultimately a an amazing world where everyone is expressing a, a unique image of God that they manifest through education. So it was very much what he was saying. And his models, again, he had a very complex, what we would call theory of human development, which went through a couple of phases. Uh, his models include uh, emotion almost always, um, which is interesting that you have reason, emotion, and will as like a very commonly recurring triple uh, which you also end up seeing later in other people. <laughs> uh, Comenius was very into triples, um, in part because he was, you know, the, the God, the Father, and the Holy Ghost, or whatever. Uh, oh, so, yeah. so there's a lot of that. There's a lot of Comenius trying to find a way to, um, you know, articulate a vision of human potential 
that uh, appeals beyond just the medieval Christian pietism. So he's, and again, that's what's so interesting about his work and why it's hard to simply dismiss his religious views because he's not um, he's not a medieval scholastic. Um, he's a po he's post bacon, right? He's post printing press and a few other things. Uh, so that makes it just very interesting uh, to look at his to look at his work because he ends up saying, um, yeah, he ends up saying things that sound a lot like contemporary human development theory, just like you're saying that there are these phases that people go through, just like trees go through phases or young animals go through phases. So he's making those comparisons to nature and saying that there's a way that the human unfolds and we can direct that unfoldment. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a rich pedagogical, there's a rich pedagogical strain. You can go to him for a theory of everything, pan and you can go to him for theology and complex stuff. But you can also, the great didactic in several of his pedagogical works, he literally gets right down to like, here's how you structure the school building. Here's what should be on the walls of the school building. Here's how the day should be organized. At this age, you teach this. At this age, you teach that. At this age, you teach that. Like he'd like, like literally an instruction manual for what we would think of as a modern school. Uh, and those books were massively influential. That's what got him invited to be a consultant to the Royal Court of Sweden, for example. They wanted him to build the schools that he had laid out, uh, but he met resistance <laughs> uh, from the religious conservatives there. Um, so yeah, so there's 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 um, more than a few lessons to be learned from what Comenius did while he was in a time between worlds, and what we can do, given that we are also in a time between worlds and that's because i mean we're we're yeah. looking into something that we cannot grasp and, exactly. and we have started up a process where um damn it what's going to be on the other side and how do we create the other side how do we how do we get through this in a healthy way and he was he wasn't even struggling with the climate he was just struggling mm -hmm. with communication technology we're going to deal with both um mm -hmm. plus artificial intelligence and the mass extinction of species. I mean, there, there's, we're in some. Um, I think you're allowed to say deep shit uh, in this uh, in this podcast video series. And and he was. On the other hand, we have more knowledge than he did, and we do understand ourselves and the world better. I mean, we do have more tools and, and insights. But uh, but the the feeling of um, having a hard time grasping what is going on and having a hard time when you do think that you do grasp some things uh, to get other people to see it and open that conversation. Um, that is where I, I think, and, and you've pointed this out, that we are in a similar situation. Yeah, we're in a similar situation. And, and again, the 30 years war was also something I didn't learn a lot about as an American. Uh, and then when I started to look into it, basically to learn about Comenius's context, um, it really should be understood as the First World War. I mean, it was it was tremendously devastating, uh, and to be in that chaos of bloodshed and crops burning and the plague was ravishing at the same time, like uh, it would be hard not to think that the world was ending. Um, and he did. I mean, Comenius was the and the unity the Bohemian Brethren were a millenarian group, they believed that the world that they had known was ending. And one of the things Comenius was doing was like trying to get education in good enough state that when the new world came, we wouldn't miss the, the boat, <laughs> you know? Uh, but he really thought that this was all ending and it, and it looked that way. Like, I forget, it was like a third of the population of Europe or something died during that. During that was during the plague, right? Yeah, during the plague and the Thirty Years' War combined. Um, okay, wow. So I mean, so the Thirty Year War that is that ends in what sixteen forty eight. So it starts so, uh, in later than that. I don't 16, know the exact, but he lived through the whole thing. Or something? Yeah, yeah. Whole, and yeah. we have the uh, the Reformation. Luther. Uh, I don't know if he actually put that you know ninety five thesis on the wall or, or, or the door. Yeah. It's just a, a good you know story. But so that was like fifteen nineteen fifteen seventeen ish, and then yeah. I know that Denmark had the uh, um, Reformation in 1539-ish. This is going to be embarrassing because people who watch this can just Google it. Uh, so this is actually my my honest memory. If I get it wrong, um, yeah. uh, I will I will write it in the you know uh, chat or something. But the um, I mean, and and we mentioned that with the Catholics and the Protestants because 
what we also need to understand is that the printing press, as you said, played a huge role in this war and the propaganda. And you had these printers who were you know, living in one ringwalled city with one ruler. And so they were under his protection. And then they printed pamphlets that were mocking the other ruler. Exactly. And then the other ruler was, of course, you know, angry and wanted to kill him and the other ruler and burned down the printing press. But then if he got into trouble with the first ruler, he might actually just start printing pamphlets about him and flee to the other ruler that, that would then protect him and his printing press. So, I mean, you right. had these, um, it was a completely different landscape and you had inside the wall and outside the wall. And then you had yeah. these huge printing presses um, and you had uh, the, and from having just one, allowed religion across the European continent, you went into having two, and the second one of them was divided into all kinds of, you know, subcategories who were also fighting one another. And then what used to be there was that the Pope wanted the political power along with the religious power. And what actually, you know, broke up that political fabric was the, the Reformation and the printing press. And <laughs> Um, the many of the Protestant uh, rulers didn't just leave Catholicism for you know the salvation of their soul and eternity, but to get away from the Pope and his political yeah, power. That's exactly right. And this was a path to not individual religious freedom, but collective religious freedom, where the ruler decided. So, in my kingdom, in my duchy, whatever we're all Protestants or we're all yeah. Catholics. Uh, and then we have communities and the Jews and probably a couple yeah. of other yeah. groups that we don't like, and then we can unite around hating yeah. them. But um, yeah. the two big ones were the Protestants and the Catholics. Yeah. And the power of the Pope that used to be, you know, cross everything and over everything and under everything and which had the monasteries and where you had, and that was the old communication technology where you had these monks writing with pen and feather and could make one copy at the yeah. time. I mean, yeah. that was really the what what broke up the entire political fabric and the economic fabric and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it, it was huge. And one of the points that I usually make when I when I talk about this is that all the political institutions that you and I know and everybody else who's alive now and the legislation that we have in our societies are the printing press and radio and television yep. uh, institutions and legislation and structures. And we have nation states that were built around printing presses and radio and television. Mm -hmm. And whenever we've had one of these big new communication technologies, that has usually led to bloodshed and mm -hmm. to a new restructuring of, of uh, the political landscape and the size, the group size of people. and uh it, it's obvious that with the internet and with cell phones and twitter and all the other social media we're, we're going into a global culture the question is can we keep rule of law and freedom and democracy and institutions and meaningful education and all the all the good stuff that came out of the printing press era yeah. as we transition to something that will have to be global not least because we're facing global problems with mass extinction climate blah blah the mm -hmm. blah 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 things that we keep yeah. repeating um so so that is why we're in this this transition and can compare ourselves to to communions but it was really a, a a drastic bloodshed that tore europe apart and also you had all these people who then uh went to the colonies and, and one of them became uh, the united states yeah um, exactly. and and they went there to you know pursue religious freedom yeah, to absolutely. you know uh their own kind of you know vision of hell and heaven after this life yeah yeah Comenius was actually invited to be one of the first presidents of what would become harvard uh when it was basically a colonial wilderness outpost <laughs> uh and he declined oh, shed somewhere yeah, exactly um so yeah so everything you're saying is true it's hard historically to characterize that period um uh in a way that kind of conveys the gravitas of the kind of seismic transformations that were occurring as a result of the printing press and a few other things. Um, 
And so like people like Emmanuel Wallerstein, who's the founder of World Systems Analysis, who looks at the nature of the capitalist world system, its emergence and its transformation. He points to these years, the long 16th century, sometimes it's called when, when you get this almost unbelievable transition out of what was a pretty stable feudal system becomes it worked for a thousand years and becomes very quickly all of a sudden very destabilized and tremendous overwhelming violence and then the emergence of new theories of law new theories of political power new forms of economic exchange new communication technologies and they bring us what we know as the bourgeois revolution the founding of the united states um, the peace of westphalia and the nation state system that we basically inherited um and uh i think and it's it's funny because communists have, like had his hands in everything but you know he wrote to the leaders of europe um this book a little brief book just called the angel of peace where he basically proposes the united nations be formed like it uh and this is again one of the places where kant right emmanuel kant sources his idea for perpetual peace which became the league of nations which became the united nations he sources it in this communion's text from the 1640s where he's trying to address all the crowns of europe as the angel of peace saying we could get a a superordinate entity that would allow us to have peace and it would have to be educational like unesco and all these other things so uh even that sense that there could be some way of orchestrating international peace was a communion idea. Um, and then what you're saying today is correct, that we are in a similar transformation. And this is what's so unnerving about the time to live in, is that we are looking at a technology uh, and a system of global disruptions that are fundamental enough to destabilize the rule of law and to change the foundation of the political systems that we're in, which is why we're also in an educational crisis, because that means who the hell are we? <laughs> and, and what do we do? Um, so yeah, so we are need, we're gonna need an educational system as different from the modern educational system as the modern educational system was from the feudal educational system. And this is just very obvious to me. Um, just like we're going to need an economic system as different from capitalism as capitalism was from the feudal system. That's how fundamental the change is. Uh, and so what that means is that, and this is the whole point of my second book, you know, most of the things we're doing to try to kind of fix the modern schools are beside the point, kind of wasting our time. We should actually be really thinking like communist it was, back to first principles about what is education fundamentally for, why, why do humans do this? What is the actual nature of the human? How do societies work? And then reboot a way of thinking about education from those first principles, um, which should it should sound crazy. It should sound crazy because communists' ideas sounded crazy to probably seventy percent of the people. It was only a small number of people who actually were already seeing the Dutch East India Company and looking at their kingdoms falling apart and seeing the effects of the printing press who realized, oh, that's not crazy. <laughs> that's actually correct. Um, uh, so, yeah. so what are we going to do, Sachstein? <laughs> well, so the lessons from Comenius are, are several fold. One is get involved with the leading edges of technology innovation for the sake of education. Right? Um, so this means that as much as I would love to stop everyone from using digital technologies that's not completely true but as dangerous as i think that are, virtual reality and augmented reality and all of that stuff um uh the path forward is through those um it is not around those um uh which means we have to as educators find a way to play that game better than the people who are currently playing it which is what comedians did like he made a textbook that was actually more popular and more innovative than any of the other things that people could get their hands on. Um, so if we really do know better how people learn and we really do have a good sense of how human development works and what the humane goals of education ought to be, then we should be able to somehow make educational technologies that are, that are powerful and liberating um, instead of the opposite. Uh, addicting and confusing which is what most of them are now because they're not actually educational technologies they're attention capturing profit making um propaganda distributing caps locks uh inducing 
exactly. uh, yeah. conflict promoting Right. Um, yeah, Mastin is uh, repeating. Yeah. Uh, repeating. Yes, yes. The first, the first move is handling that. Is is not pretending we can somehow make great schools somewhere and not address this problem that's in the in the palm of everyone's hand, which is these communication technologies that are fundamentally disrupting everything. So, and then there's a lot to say about what would those what would those actually educational digital technologies look like. So that's a whole conversation, but that's one thing. Uh, the other one is, um, uh, basically the unavoidability of doing very high level philosophy as an aspect of thinking about education. This is something that Comenius teaches us, which is that education actually requires profound interdisciplinary research and very deep questions about the nature of what it means to be human, the nature of what is ethical, the nature of what is true. Uh, so, and communities did and not- we have almost yeah. lost our language for that. We have almost completely lost our language for that, which is education has become understood as basically about the problem of modern schooling, full stop. So that's the first thing. If you say education, people think, oh, schools. And you're like, oh, no. Well, that's what you mean. Eight o'clock till three o'clock in the afternoon, Monday <laughs> exactly. to Friday. That's right. how, and how then, hard can it be? Yeah, and then within the problem of modern schooling, education means this very specific problem of like optimal pedagogy for test score production and these kinds of very narrow problems. And there's no sense of what the hell are we actually doing this for? How do human minds actually work? What are the genes? I remember when I was a doctoral student, I was the only doctoral student uh, in my graduate school of education and studying philosophy, first of all. Uh, and we, we were supposed to do like things where we went to actual schools and talk to principals and stuff. And we go around and say what we're studying. And it's like, oh, someone's studying language acquisition of underprivileged kids and someone's studying like, you know, math education and that kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, I'm a philosopher of education. And the principal looked at me like, like I had two heads, like, what the hell are you doing here? Uh, so that's another thing Comedius teaches us, which is actually that the deepest innovations in education will come from the people asking the deepest questions about what education is and what it's for and what humans are and what the universe is. Um, like it's at that level, fundamentally, we need to ask these questions. Um, and that's some of what I try to do in my work and some of what actually makes me say things like that whatever comes next educationally will involve a return to certain forms of religiosity. So whereas the modern schools were predicated upon exiting the religious <laughs> and separating church and state, uh, whatever comes next uh, is going to re-enter the religious in another way. Um, and this occurs, uh, I think it's part of what might be called uh, metamodernity um, is a return to a kind of post, not a return, an emergence into a post-secular kind of public culture. Um, and uh, so that, I think, is also very important when thinking about it. Um, and then the final uh, lesson that Comenius teaches us, I think, for our own time, uh, is the creation of uh, networks of committed new paradigm thinkers, for lack of a better way to say that, which is what he called the invisible college. Um, so in these times between worlds, you get very dangerous attempts from the system that's fading away to hold on for dear life, right? So he also, Camus also faced the inquisitions, right? These were occurring at that time, which were not fun. <laughs> uh, and- uh, How do you expect so the Spanish inquisition? Exactly. <laughs> and so similarly today, we're in a public culture that has certain elements that, that are Inquisition-like. Um, and so much of the best work that I've actually seen uh, that is occurring now is not occurring in public view uh, and is not occurring in universities. Um, so there's this question of if you're in a civilization that is in decline, can you use the institutions of that civilization to recreate that civilization? Or do you need to actually find a way to be invisible within that thing to create something new? Um, and so this is, I think, something we need to learn about. We need to think about what's the ratio of time and attention that needs to be given to existing things. And where are those places where we can actually 
convene and come together uh, in a way that is, you know, fundamentally questioning the assumption of those dominant institutions and their ability to meet the challenges. Um, uh, insofar as you do that vocally inside those institutions, they will kill you and kick you out. <laughs> uh, so you have to find a place to stand that's not within them, that's still a position of power that creates this new narrative about what's possible socially. And that's what he was trying to orchestrate with the Invisible College. And I think what is attempting to occur in some of the kind of spaces of public discourse I've seen, sometimes called like the liminal web or some of these heterodox voices where, where there's actually- and there are there are these networks of people and you and I are, you know, in mm -hmm. some of them and meeting um, thinkers, writers, uh, doers in, um, in in various constellations. And, and it is really hard to explain what it is we're doing. And we are really, you know, yes, the liminal web, I mean, on the, you know, outskirts of, of what can be said and done at the moment and what mm -hmm. our institutions can, can grasp and hold. And I, I mean, when when uh, we started Nordic Bildung as an organization, we were thinking in in meta modern terms and in Bildung terms, and and we've been struggling for the past four years, four and a half years since we started, with having all these new thoughts and having all these, we think, important things to say about where we are, where we could go, and to getting it into the existing infrastructure because you have all these people who are pursuing knowledge we're pursuing education and it can be adult education it can be lifelong learning it can be formal informal education it can be kids in school i mean we have all there are so many people who spend time learning yeah. stuff and we already have the infrastructure for that the question is how do we raise the questions of tomorrow uh within these existing frameworks because uh when people lose the existential and intellectual foothold in the world that they used to know mm -hmm. they will eventually ask for for the past and we've seen that with the um attack on the congress in the united states yeah. where a lot of people have actually lost the foothold in the country that they used to know and in a life that they used to you know thrive in yeah. and uh and here you and i are we're speaking across the atlantic right now yeah. and we're speaking the latin of today which is english yeah. and um, not everybody around the world can can uh, participate in this conversation. Just within the EU, we have united coal and steel for 72 years, but we have not taught everybody the same language. So that yeah. we have, I don't know if it's like four or 500 million Europeans who cannot actually talk to one another. Yeah. Um, only a, a certain layer of Europeans can actually communicate. And communities and, I mean, how democratic is that? He would be he shocked. Would be, he's rolling in his grave. That's what I'm he hearing. Because he thought it was so obvious that mm -hmm. the trajectory of human evolution was towards some single language and towards some single set of comprehensive knowledge and towards some. So, and again, it was like a, it, he was like meta modern before modernity emerged. It was very, it's very weird. That's how I read him, actually. It's he like, was meta, meta traditional or something. Yeah. So there's a, so a few things. One is that, it, well, everything you're saying is making me just want to underline that sense of like in a time between worlds, the only way you can think about education is to think about philosophy and first first principles, because um, we, we don't know what's going to happen. And the tendency when the existing structure starts to become uh, indecipherable and you can't tell where you are anymore to look back towards something isn't wrong, but it's not historically backwards <laughs> towards some place that used to exist in the 50s or whatever when America was awesome, uh, but actually towards the foundation of what the principles are of what the thing was founded for. Um, so a return to first principles and first values is essential. And for me, this is also a return to thinking about psychology in a very fundamental way, which is what, again, um, when you read Communius, it, you call it a conception of man or a philosophical anthropology or something, but at the end of the day, it's a psychology. It's about how does the human mind and soul work, and if it works that way, therefore, how ought education to be? Uh, so, I, uh, so I think we don't want to take too many steps forward um, in thinking about this future educational system, which will emerge no matter what, that's the thing. <laughs> like it's going to be different no matter what. Shouldn't it will be there. 
something will be there. Um, ideally, it will be something that is in a very sophisticated way informed about the best of what we know about humans, actually, how they grow, how they develop, and how they learn. Um, and, you know, just like we are concerned right now with planetary boundaries, right, the limits to growth, right, that there are certain physiological limits that the biosphere simply cannot be pushed beyond without failing and therefore killing everything. Uh, so there are what I would call like psychosocial uh, boundaries, planetary psychosocial limits, which is to say uh, you can only exploit human nature uh, for so long before you start to degrade the very substrate of the civilization, which is to say humans are needed to run civilization. If you create institutions that run so counter to how humans actually function that they become desperately, psychologically unhealthy, uh, unable to- Angry, function. anxiety, depressed. Violence. Everything that we see in college students and high school students today. I mean, yeah. the- uh, psychopharmaceutical stuff, you know. Exactly. Who are we as a species if 51% are on psychopharmaceuticals? Mm -hmm. Well, and we, we, who we are as a species is not the species that can survive in this type of social system, right? And that's, and again, I believe that while we're comfortable looking at ecological and physical externalities of our technologies, like they create pollution and they create energy drain and all that stuff, we don't look at the psychosocial externalities of our technologies. Um, and the psychosocial externalities are just as extreme, sometimes worse, uh, and do have hard limits. <laughs> uh, and those limits are, you know, decency and sanity uh, and capacity and psychological health, capacity for love, capacity for empathy, those kinds of things. Uh, you those can be destroyed and now we're back to communism's point that in the absence of education you still get something happening <laughs> and it could be anti-educational and you could end up with something on your hands that's actually worse than having a bunch of wild animals uh, you have a bunch of uh completely indoctrinated and incapacitated um human beings um, who have desires that can't be satisfied the animals can satisfy their desires humans don't because we have this weird conception of infinity which like infuses all of our emotional states and desires uh and communius saw that like the, the human is different from the animal and that our mind is connect, connected to the infinite mind that's what he called it uh, and so therefore we are capable of becoming almost anything uh, therefore we have to be very careful with what we do with education <laughs> uh so so yeah so this is just me saying we need to think in a careful way these days about what are the philosophies and psychologies that are forming our educational theories are we even thinking about that so like if if you're rolling out an educational technology um do you even have a formal theory of psychology or philosophy that it's based on or you just think this type of thing will be interesting and work which is what mostly what i hear or, from we're more efficient of reproducing the transfer of knowledge that we've been doing for the past 50 years right um as a, as a citizen and as an economist, I mean, when you were talking right now about, you know, uh, dignity and the values behind everything, I just sensed how weird that sounds. <laughs> um, I mean, we've grown up in this uh, culture that just wants to optimize everything, that wants to be more efficient at everything and where everybody is, um, you know, a part of the production system. And mm -hmm. it it just sounds weird when you go for so what why do we educate what does it mean to be human what is human dignity about what is how is life meaningful what is I mean, what is moral and ethical values that and there used to be, be behind this. so like in it's just so weird to say it it is and in communities today it was like okay what's the point of education if you're if you're not going to be a feudal peasant right the feudal system disappearing so what do we do with you and today it's similar it's like What's the point of education today if we're not going to be a wage laborer? Right? So we're, we're looking at an economy where a smaller percentage of people will be quote unquote productive members uh, because of artificial intelligence and other things. Um, and you're even looking at models of economic growth that are um, uh, fundamentally changing the way we distribute wealth and the nature of human productivity. So you have to ask a fundamental question, which is, yeah, what is the point of education if it is not to produce wage laborers? 
I think that's a very hard question to answer in modern contexts of educational thinking, because the whole point of the modern education system was to create wage laborers. You could say maybe good citizens, but that was actually supplanted by wage laborers sometime in the 60s or 70s. Um, so it's really about being a wage laborer. And so that means that we don't have an answer to that question. Like we literally, as a society, don't have an answer to the question of what's the point of education if it's not to get a job, right? Is it to be a good person? Well, what the hell does that mean, right? Do we have what? what do we have a person cultural, to say that? Do we have the cultural resources to answer a question? What does it mean to be a good person? And this is why we're stuck in a situation of having to return to some of these religious languages. And Habermas talks about this later. Uh, in his late work, Howard Moss returns to religion, and he talks about the untapped semantic potentials of religious language as needing to be resuscitated in our times because of the collapse of the secular as a means to validate the rule of law and democracy. And so it's a post-secular. It's not a return to medieval <laughs> forms of fundamentalism, um, but it's a layering on top of the secular uh, this capacity for deep reflection about the nature of the human. And the most vulnerable among us are the ones who require the languages of religion to be protected because the languages of capitalism and efficiency don't protect the most vulnerable at all. Why protect the most vulnerable? The, the stock owners of the uh, Dutch uh, East India Company. Right. So it's like, why educate the learning disabled? Just from an efficiency standpoint, and I'm dyslexic, so this is very personal to me. It's like, why invest actually more money in me for maybe less outcome productivity-wise than this kid? You could route the resources away from me and just give it to this kid who's going to be a CEO no matter what. So, so this question of why do we educate the learning disabled? Like, why do we care for the fundamentally dis disabled? Uh, the only way to answer those questions are through in invoking some kind of religious language. Uh, so one of the one of the things that is basically human and, and I guess all children have it unless it is the very, very tiny minority of children who are psychopaths. Um, all children want to be good persons. I mean, they, they want to show their parents and the adults around them that they're good that, mm -hmm. and, and they want to know that they're good and they really want to live up to our expectations. They completely fail most of the time because they're children. And they don't understand the uh, you know surroundings and oh there's a cat and oh there's a ball and and could I have some candy I mean so they they aren't really in the place to um, to to do everything that they that they want and uh, I guess that as adults we tend to misunderstand them a lot because we have higher expectations that are you know reflecting what we can do ourselves um, but I think that one of the fundamental things that we need to understand also when it comes to political differences in a time of great changes is that we're all moral people i mean deep down we're all moral people there are everybody has a sense of what is right and wrong and we can definitely ruin that with education we can ruin that with a ton of stuff but the reason why we do have political conflict is because everybody cares totally. uh, if people if people did not care, they would just walk away and not care, and there wouldn't be any conflict. And um, and so so on that note, and when when you're talking about going back to uh, a religious inspiration or you know the language and the understanding of the human spirit of what it means to be human, what it means to build uh, communities and society, and that's one of the things that I very often miss when people talk about spirituality for instance it seems very much like a, a subjective experience of some kind of emotional state mm -hmm. that is just my individual you know experience in the moment where i connect with whatever it is rather than having this higher purpose that we share which becomes the highest organizing principle which allows us to have a, a functioning society and communities and where we can trust other people and where there's there's a word that we rarely use unless we go to a restaurant which is service um the, the service of a higher purpose the service of others the service of, of community and to take that upon ourselves and to have that language and and to expect that from ourselves and to raise a family around it to raise a community around it and and that is a religious language and we really lost it yeah. Um, and it feels kind of weird to start using it, um, yeah, but I did also study theology, so I have used the words okay. before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
But yeah, no, it's really out of you know, the habit of using these words and it, it feels <laughs> awkward and it takes a lot of uh, moral courage and personal courage and uh, you know, getting used to the words to stand up and say it in front of strangers. <laughs> but we do need to go back to those words and um yeah well and, and they're there you know we could we could keep carrying on this conversation for hours and at some point we do have to stop um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh let me say one thing though. let me say one more thing which is that which is to you which is your point about the everyone's a good person everyone's pursuing the good and this is Caminius's point too he's like you need to be educated into the good but you are spontaneously predisposed to seek it but if you don't know where to find it, you will find something that is not it. Uh, so that relationship between the naturally or God-given, as Caminius would say, instinct towards the good and the educator who allow, who taps into that instinct and brings you towards the good. These are, these are related. Um, very, very, very small number of people are truly sociopathic, even though our society rewards sociopathy these days. Yeah, we're um, almost creating them. Um, yeah, yeah, or yeah. I actually think we are because we're we're yeah. uh, rewarding the you know yep. the least moral behavior and the you know the, the short sightedness and the profit seeking and the uh, we're one of the so let me just say something good about capitalism before we uh, before we conclude because one of the things that it has done uh, is really the the pooling of money, which means that we've uh, had the opportunity and possibility of modern science because if there had not been uh, a non-religious pooling of money because people were paying into the vatican and you know paying for all their sins and that was really profitable um mm -hmm. but the investment in the company allowed us as a society to produce an economic surplus that could be turned into science and mm -hmm. so uh, something good did come out of it but it has had its time and it, it doesn't have a a, a stop button or a you know, dead man's handle or a, a break or anything it just keeps capitalizing everything that is around it and so somehow we will have to make a, a conscious deliberate choice about what should this economy look like what is the purpose of the economy what is the purpose of society what is the purpose of life and what is the purpose of education and um so my, my last question to you, uh, hoping that we can at some point in this conversation, not because I want to end it, because <laughs> uh, we do have to stop at some point, um, which is how do you, I mean, you spoke about uh, education in different ways in one of our events, either the Global Building Day or the European Building Day. And you were talking about, you know, community education and having multiple generations together studying together and learning from one another and you also talked about this transfer of knowledge between uh generations so if if you could conclude with that because i think that's really crucial <clears throat> yeah yeah i talk a lot about uh intergenerational transmission of culture right and that uh and again another thing communius just saw clear as day which was that the only way you get a future society <laughs> is by having this generation give to the next generation the skills and personality traits and emotional dispositions they need to actually run that society. So there's this, what I call societal autopoiesis, right? The self recreation of the society is fundamentally the self reproduction of the social system through education, through intergenerational transmission. So one of the things that technologies do, especially communication technologies, is create generational gaps when the social and socialization environment is so different between the elders and the youth that it becomes very difficult for them to actually understand each other. Um, and this is a situation we are approaching a kind of terminal generational gap, like a very catastrophic um, distance between generations, um, which to me is perhaps one of the most telling signs of an imminent civilizational collapse is that if you fundamentally disrupt intergenerational transfer of key knowledge and capacity the thing just grinds to a halt um, just grinds to a halt and then the worst case scenario is that you end up getting generational warfare um, which is what some marxists believe eventually class warfare will be sublimated into generational warfare because at the end of the day we're taking from the future <laughs> when we create debt um so and i think that this is also occurring now we're beginning to see the um uh 
the generational gap it turn into a cross generational animosity animosity and then you get strategic interaction between generations instead of cooperative action between generations so like in the united states the student loan situation is fundamentally about intergenerational warfare because it's like who does this to their kids I mean, who does this to their kids um, it was the neighbor's kids right it's the neighbor's kids that's right it's the neighbor's kids uh yeah uh so it, it is it is interesting and again children are the most vulnerable in the social system so if you have a social system that doesn't have the languages necessary to protect the vulnerable but only the languages of efficiency and extraction and productivity then kids are by definition freeloaders on that system which means that you're going to resent the kids because they're they're costing money without making money uh, and they require a lot of investment in order to be productive eventually and may not become productive eventually. And then they better make some money when they can because they, now we've invested this much money in them. Exactly. So there's this very complex, what I see is just like a low-grade systemic child abuse taking place, <laughs> uh, which has to do with that instrumentalizing and overtly strategic relationship of the older generation to the younger generation, uh, which is the opposite of how it should be. Right? That the actual relation of parenting and teaching is one of giving without thought of return, full stop. Investing without thought of recouping your expenses um, uh, and creating possibility and capacity in someone so that they can do what they need to do, not what you want them to do, right? which is a non-strategic relationship of teacherly authority where you, re you recognize the asymmetry of capacity. You need to learn from me. But because you're vulnerable and need to learn, I'm precisely not going to take advantage of you, <laughs> uh, as opposed to seeing that as an opportunity to put you into debt and to make you have capabilities that make it only possible for you to do the things that I want you to do, right? Which is the way it kind of looks right now. So yeah, so we're reaching a very critical threshold in the current educational crisis where there's a climaxing of catastrophic generational gap. Um, and uh, I've got my eye on that. So one of the key innovations here is actually facilitating contexts where the generations can come together outside of the information war space. Um, uh, and both sides want that, but both sides are very scared of that. Right? Mm. Like the, the kids look at the elders and say, like, you created this mess. Like, what could you possibly have to teach us? And often the elders look at the kids and they're like, I created this mess. Like, what do I have to teach you? <laughs> like, and that's why they create all these fictions about the indigo kids. And oh, actually, the kids are great at multitasking and the kids will solve all the problems and the technologies are actually good for the kids. And that's that's you know assuaging the guilt of the elders for the situation that they've actually put the kids in, hoping the kids actually become heroic and can solve the problems. And the kids are resenting <laughs> the elders for being put in that situation, and they're still stealing money from us and stealing our future from us. So it's, it's an issue. It's a real issue. And a lot of the dystopian science fiction novels like Clockwork Orange and other places revolve around this type of generational gap that becomes so extreme that it culminates in uh, a rift and a kind of violence and warfare between generations. Um, so, yeah, we need to pray to the spirit of Comenius that education innovation will rain down from heaven upon us. <laughs> I think we can do uh, something else too. I think we, you and I are sort of in the, you know, not in the grandparents' generation. We're not in the kids' generation either. So we can encourage the grandparents and the kids to start. watch this together yeah. while yeah. the parents are at work. It's true. Um, yeah. Gen Generation X is the key to this whole thing. Exactly. Right? So, I mean, we're, we're talking to the, you know, the, the 15 to 25 year olds and the, uh, you know, 60 to uh, and up. And, uh, and then we'll let the others go to work and uh, hopefully the others will find us on YouTube. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you, this. Zach. This is yeah. a great pleasure. I hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah, I, I welcome that. <laughs>